We begin today's lecture on the history of American literature with a focus on nationalism and the Revolutionary War with a short statement about the types of information you find in this lecture series. Please make note that we are certainly not covering the variety, rich variety and vast scope of information and people and events that occur during these time periods. We're simply doing sort of a tip of the iceberg approach to what's going on in the country at any given time as a way to give you a flavor for how the history has molded and influenced the literature that was written at the time and also how the literature has shaped history. So today we will be learning about, as I said, the period known as nationalism or reason and revolution we call it. And this involves the birth of the United States of America. In order to better understand what's happening in the American colonies at this time, it's helpful to acknowledge world influences. In Europe and other parts of the world, this time period is known as the Enlightenment. It was a time when reason, logic, and science were held in high regard. The great and influential thinkers of the time felt that it was possible to reach the truth through reason and logic, that society could obtain order and truth through science, and that humans had unlimited potential. All of these ideas influenced American intellectuals at the time and likely aided in the fight for independence from England. Now you'll recall the time period right before this we called Puritanism with an extreme influence on religion, especially in the northern colonies and those were um, a lot more politically active in many respects um, in the American Revolution. Consider the difference between the way the Puritans viewed life and approached life, feeling that they were chosen, feeling that they had to rely on their faith and their beliefs in God, and that's where they could find their answers. This now becomes quite a shift because now we have people relying not on God, but on reason and logic and human potential. This is quite a shift, as I said, and what it represents for us is oftentimes we find that an example of that shift occurs when you see an opposite reaction to something that has happened before. Now, in addition to an intellectual focus around the world and in the colonies, the American colonies were becoming quite prosperous. In short, they were making their investors in England and Europe very wealthy. Thus, communication between the colonies became of utmost importance, especially from the standpoint of remaining consistent economically and financially. As with any group of common-minded people who share common successes and experiences, the colonial states began to find value in sticking together. A new sense of unity began to develop, a need to present a united front to England. Some common experiences included unfair taxes, the intrusion of British soldiers sometimes into people's homes, unfair laws. For instance, a colonist who was charged with a crime might have to wait a very long time before facing trial and may even be shipped back to England. The colonists were starting to feel overly oppressed and underappreciated. People were trying to be heard and they were writing to be heard, but they were also writing because of their belief in reason, logic, and human potential. People were writing to unite the colonies, to communicate common ideas, to fuel political independence, and also to begin to develop an American identity. History tells us that literary forms are sometimes born out of necessity, and this is most certainly true with the types of writing that developed around the American Revolution. It seemed everyone had something to say and felt empowered to proclaim his or her ideas to the masses. Political activists like Thomas Paine emerged and printed broadsides, pamphlets, etc., sometimes anonymously, and never had the term freedom of the press been more true than during the American Revolution. So, the reading and writing of the time was driven by the ideals of democracy Everyone felt his or her voice was important, and he or she had something to say. In fact, it was a little like our social media of today. 
Today, anyone with a computer and internet access can communicate his or her ideas to the masses. During the time period we call nationalism, anyone with access to a printing press or a newspaper office could likewise communicate his or her ideas. As a result, both now and then, some of the publications were not always professional or sophisticated, but they included such pieces as broadsides, which were poster-like pieces, essays, newspaper articles, songs, poems, letters, sometimes fictional and satirical, and pamphlets. All of these types of writing served to begin to forge not only unity and a distinctly American identity, but also to incite the kinds of radical incendiary ideas necessary to fuel a revolution of epic proportions. Thus, never was the need greater for persuasive, well-written documents. At one point, only one-third of the colonies was in full support of the revolution. Another one-third was loyal to England, and the last one-third was rather indifferent. They figured, hey, we have it pretty good over here. We're making uh, some good money. We're comfortable. We're, we're happy. Why do we want to rock the boat? The Founding Fathers needed to create convincing arguments that the revolution was necessary. The writing of the time needed to be powerful enough to convince the colonists that the revolution was vital. Thomas Paine, who I mentioned earlier, was one of those instrumental voices for the American Revolution. And, interestingly enough, he was born and raised in England. As a radical Englishman, though, and a general all-around troublemaker, Thomas Paine's qualities piqued the interests of Benjamin Franklin and one of his visits to England. Franklin invited Paine to come to America, likely promising him uh, lots of those opportunities to put his troublemaking skills to work for the revolution. Paine, however, proved to be an invaluable asset and a prime example of how literature influences history. Paine's pamphlet, Common Sense, which he originally published anonymously, he was a troublemaker, but he was also pretty smart, and he didn't want to get himself killed in the process. That publication served to fuel the revolution with its strong and fiery rhetoric. Many historians today believe that Common Sense and Paine's other publications were crucial for convincing colonists to support the American Revolution. If you have a chance, try to pick up a copy of Common Sense by Thomas Paine. Its rhetorical as well as historical value will be immediately evident. In other words, that boy could write a strong argument. Here's an excerpt. This new world hath been the asylum for the persecuted lovers of civil and religious liberty from every part of Europe. Hither have they fled, not from the tender embraces of the mother, but from the cruelty of the monster. And it is so far true of England that the same tyranny which drove the first emigrants from home pursues their descendants still. What do you notice about the diction, the word choice in this excerpt? What words or phrases have particular power and why? Look at how he refers to how you would expect to be embraced by a mother in England, and instead of a mother, it's a cruel monster. Though Paine's literary genius is notably apparent, not all literature, novels, essay, poems, etc., were created equal or were uniquely American in nature during this time period. The sheer volume of writing that occurred, much like the internet today, was bound to eventually produce not only works of clear literary merit, amid all the mediocre writing, but also works that were representative of a new nation, a new culture, and a new way of thinking. It would be a few more years, however, before the first uniquely American identity emerges. That being said, the two main topics of interest in literature at the time were focused on, of course, the American Revolution and on the vast wilderness that still existed in the colonies. The most persuasive and influential and well-written document of the day, however, has to be the Declaration of Independence. Oddly enough, 
Not many thought the document was initially going to be all that important. In fact, the two most important and well-respected gentlemen on the drafting committee, Benjamin Franklin, there he is again, and John Adams, chose to assign the youngest and least known committee member, one Thomas Jefferson, to write the complete draft. Jefferson had just recovered from a terrible bout of pneumonia when they gave him the task. I believe he had something to prove, and he worked many hours alone on the draft before submitting it to the committee. Interestingly enough, Jefferson, who also owned slaves himself, included in the Declaration of Independence a provision to free the slaves. Unfortunately, though, the success of the revolution depended, as we said before, on unity, 100% colonial unity, and there was no way the southern colonies, whose economic success depended heavily on slave labor, would have agreed to such a provision. Thus, Jefferson's noble effort was edited out of the document. Ultimately, the Declaration of Independence became one of America's seminal texts. We will be looking more closely at this document soon. It is truly a remarkable piece of writing and turned out to be most influential. Well, the revolution didn't happen overnight, and it certainly couldn't have been successful without outside influences and outside help, too. One such influence was J. Hector St. John de Crevecoeur, a Frenchman who spent a large part of his life as a colonial farmer. Even though he eventually moved back to France and died there, he wrote a book entitled The American Farmer and added the concept of the melting pot to the American lexicon. He sought to define what it was to be an American when he wrote that an American was a person who left, quote, behind him all his prejudices and manners and received new ones from the new mode of life he has embraced, the new government he obeys, and the new rank he holds, end quote. He further identified that in America, quote, individuals of all nations are melted into a new race of men, end quote. So now as we come to the close of our lecture, let's look at some of the key writers of the time, some of which we have looked at more closely here. Here are some folks who we consider to have made a lasting impact. Thomas Jefferson with the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Paine, Common Sense, The Crisis, and many others. Benjamin Franklin, who just received short mention here with the Declaration of Independence, was incredibly prolific. He was a brilliant man, a brilliant statesman, a brilliant strategist. He's worth looking into. Poor Richard's Almanac would be a good place to start. Joel Barlow wrote um, some satirical poems and humor in The Hasty Pudding. Phyllis Wheatley, who was actually George Washington's slave, wrote religious verses, poems, and songs, many of them honoring George Washington. Philip Freneau wrote satire and poems, and as mentioned here, J. Hector St. John de Crevecoeur with letters from an American farmer. Finally, Noah Webster, yes, the dictionary guy, changed the American colonies by charging the colonists with an important task. Because although the American Revolution could not have taken place without countless sacrifice and loss of life, Webster recognized that sheer might in battle was not enough to sustain or grow a country. This quote reminds the great people of the colonies that they will need more than just political and economic strength to remain successful. They will need strong writers and strong ideas. He states, quote, America must be as independent in literature as she is in politics, as famous for the arts as for the arms. So as we move forward, that is the charge for American literary development. Let's see what happens next.